The Shah of Iran is often portrayed as a tyrant and many consider him the main reason that the Islamic Revolution took place. But how true is that? In this video, I want to show you the extent of the hostility of some Iranians towards the Pahlavi dynasty. I often ask myself whether so much hatred, contempt, hostility and envy are even necessary. Therefore, I am convinced that instead of demonizing these kings and making them the the most terrible dictators of all time, we should look back into history to see whether the Pahlavi kings were really that bad or not. But before we jump in, we need some context first. So at the beginning of the 20th century, Iran, or as it was known back then, Persia was an absolute monarchy ruled by the Turkic Qajar dynasty. This situation, however, changed in 1906 when the Constitutional Revolution brought forward a parliamentary monarchy with a constitution, thus ending the absolute monarchy. August 5, 1906 was a very big day in Iran, because on that day the King Muzaffar Adin Shah signed the first Iranian constitution. The constitutional revolution was a major step towards legitimizing popular sovereignty and limiting the power of the Qajar monarchs and of the Shiite clergy. For the first time, citizens can have a say in their country's politics. They elect the legislative, that is the law-giving power, the assembly. They can vote directly on laws via referendums. And they also elect the senate. The members of the assembly see themselves above all as controllers of the government. They propose the prime minister and control government finances. The government, which consists of the prime minister and his cabinet, depends on the confidence of the assembly. If the assembly casts a vote of no confidence against the minister or the prime minister, then they must resign. The Shah in this parliamentary monarchy still plays a role. The Shah can dissolve the assembly and have it re-elected. He is the commander-in-chief of the army, he can propose laws, and he can decide on war and peace. The Shah also appoints the ministers and the prime minister. As for the prime minister, he can order a referendum on laws he does not like. All this sounds fine, but this is only the theoretical view, because the situation in which the backward Iranian society of that time found itself was far from a right to use popular sovereignty. For once the fever of the constitutional revolution was over, it did not take long until anti-constitutionalists gathered at the imperial court to rewrite the constitution in their favor. The Shiite clergy, who saw the secular constitution as a threat, and the new Qajar king Muhammad Ali Shah, who was throughoutly superstitious and opposed the constitution, they joined forces and decided to reassert the power of the court and its positions by using so-called supplements to the constitution to reverse all the liberal goals of the constitutional revolution. And so, after the assassination of some constitutionalists and the shelling of the parliament by cannons on the orders of Muhammad Ali Shah, the so-called amendment to the constitution was officially adopted, effectively deleting all the secular and liberal aims of the constitutional movement. In this constitution, the Shiite clergy now enjoys special rights. Shia Islam is made the official religion of the state and non-Sharia compliant laws are not allowed to be passed. The Shiite clergy has oversight over public life and thus can override civil rights. The freedom of the press, the freedom of the person, the right to study what you want, to found associations and the freedom of the speech. These are indeed dictatorial powers that the clergy now has. And so, the more the constitution emphasizes the role of the people, the more extra power paragraphs were added to strengthen the role of Islam and the clergy. Thus, political, social and cultural freedoms that contradict Islam and the Sharia are restricted. In short, the more the divine rights of kings were restricted by the people, the more the rights of the people were restricted by the Shiite clergy. Therefore, the legalized foundation of the religious apartheid was laid in the constitution. Now, of course, the question arises, why are the Pahlavi kings then called dictators when the constitutional constitution indeed 
limited their power. The thing is, not only had the Qajar sworn an oath to protect and preserve this constitution, which had nothing of the spirit of freedom and democracy in it, as I already explained, but also the Pahlavi swore an oath to protect and to preserve it. So when in 1925 Reza Shah Pahlavi, or as he was known back then, Reza Khan, overthrew the Qajar dynasty and became the emperor of Iran, the constitution and the parliament still existed. And with them exists that one problem. A democracy is only as good as the education system that surrounds it, and the Iran of the early 20th century was far away from making a use of the right of popular sovereignty. The Iran of the then had a large illiterate population and looked very different from the Iran we see today. A democracy needs a population that is educated and knows what is best for the country, which is why many uncivilized countries in the early 20th century were ruled by educated monarchs or authoritarian strongmen, rather than democratic governments. To demonstrate you how ineffective the liberal government in Iran was, when in 1921, Reza Khan was appointed Minister of War. Iran was plagued by constant civil wars. Local militias, including revolutionaries who refused to surrender their weapons after the 1906 Constitutional Revolution, as well as local bandits, roamed freely across the country. And when Parliament refused to fund Reza Khan's campaign to quell down re- rebellions, he had to enter politics, one way or the other eventually leading to his seizure of power four years later. If you want to modernize an uncivilized country rapidly as a ruler, you need to rule with a free hand. And as I already mentioned, the Iranian constitution did not only limit the powers of the people, but also that of the king. And so Reza Shah circumvented this barrier, not by limiting the powers of the clergy, which the constitution expressly prohibited anyway, but by passing laws which increased his own powers and enabled him to do what the former Qajar kings and the parliament could not, namely defending Persia's sovereignty. Now that we have clarified how democracy failed in Iran, we can turn to the question of whether the Pahlavi kings were bloodthirsty dictators or not. But before we jump in, I want to repeat it once more. The Iranian constitution was not democratic and the Pahlavi kings never claimed to be democrat. I say this so that no one is under the illusion that the Pahlavi kings somehow destroyed democracy in Iran when it never existed there in the first place. With this in mind, let us take a closer look. Through Throughout the Pahlavi era, none of Iran's neighbors except Israel, which was established later, was democratically ruled. The social and historical characteristics of these countries, the bipolar world of the time and the fragile situation in the region simply did not allow it. Even though the Pahlavi dynasty was not democratic, neither were their opponents. The opposition was primarily made of communists who wanted to form a proletariat dictatorship like the USSR and the Islamists led by Khomeini who wanted to have a Sharia state just like the today's Islamic Republic of Iran. Ergo, like the Pahlavi kings, their opponents were also not democrats. The only difference being that the Pahlavi kings were very dedicated and energetic in serving the country's sovereignty in economic, cultural and social fields. But their opponents, I'm talking about the Islamists and communists, not only did they do not understand them and did not recognize their services, but they started fighting these kings with all their might and defamed and discredited them. The thing is, the Pahlavis, unlike the absolutist Qajars, did not use their powers to enrich themselves, but to modernize their country. Now we have talked so much about the constitution and it not being democratic, but what about Mohammad Reza Shah? Wasn't he a brutal dictator? No, not really. If we look at the definition of a dictator, we see that a dictator is generally believed to be a ruler with total power over a country, typically one who has obtained control by force. Did the Shah have total control over the country? No, he did not, especially since he had sworn to a constitution that did not provide him with such opportunities, especially against the powers of the clergy. If you remember the so-called supplementary act to the constitution, you would know that Shia Islam was the official religion of the country and the king had to protect it at all costs. Now let us go to our second question. Did the Shah of Iran seize power by force, like a dictator? No. The Shah of Iran was the Shah of Iran before and after the so-called 1953 coup d'etat, which, to be precise, cannot even be a coup, since a king cannot make a coup against himself. That makes sense, doesn't it? If not, check out my Mossadegh documentary. Anyway, 
The Shah was the crown prince and became king once his father had abdicated. When the parliament approved Reza Shah's abdication, Muhammad Reza swore the oath of allegiance to the Quran before parliament and took over the affairs of government as Shah from September 17, 1941. No bloodshed, no violence. Sure, Muhammad Reza Shah Pahlavi was an authoritarian ruler, but he was definitely not a dictator, as he did not meet the criteria of the definition of a dictator, so this designation is simply wrong. On top of that, the bond between the monarchy and the clergy has been inseparable throughout Persian history, so even if the Pahlavi kings wanted to, they could never severe that bond. Nevertheless, the Pahlavi kings defied the clerics by achieving many of the goals of the constitutional revolution. For example, civil rights, especially for women and religious minorities, economic growth and the abolition of feudalism. The religious and cultural freedom of the Pahlavi dynasty had not only mobilized the superstitious and backward clerics like Khomeini against them, who demanded that the Shah should reverse the rights of women and minorities, but also provoked many of the so-called intellectuals and political opponents, including the leftists. Now, when we hear of the Shah of Iran, Western media depicts us a picture of millions of political prisoners, draconian torture and the notorious secret police, Savak. But how true are these accusations? It is true that Iran had a secret service that was founded in the 1950s to combat communist and Islamist movements within the country. A secret police had already been established under Prime Minister Mossadegh. However, it were, took years before a real intelligence service was founded in Iran. The idea of establishing a secret service in Iran arose in talks with the US, Israel and Great Britain one year after the fall of Mossadegh. And so, the bill to establish the Savak passed the Iranian Senate on January 20, 1957 and the Iranian Parliament on March 14, 1957. Originally, the Americans stationed in, in Iran were not involved in these plans. Only later was Colonel Giraud assigned by the US to help to set up such an organization. The numbers of political prisoners during the Shah's reign are often exaggerated, obviously with the intention to demonize the Shah. For example, Amnesty International talks about 100,000 political prisoners. To give you an idea how ridiculous these accusations are, on the eve of World War II, concentration camps in Nazi Germany held around 25,000 political prisoners. So, if the most oppressive regime on earth, namely Nazi Germany, in 1939, with a population of 86 million, held around 25,000 political prisoners. How realistic is it that Iran in 1976, with a population of 30 million people, held around 100,000 political prisoners? Why were never any satellite pictures of thousands of concentration camps in Iran made in this period? I tell you why. Because these numbers are fabricated. To give you a more realistic picture... According to Parviz Sabedi, deputy director of Savak, there were 3,200 political prisoners in Iran as of 1976. It's been said that there are some 20,000 political prisoners in Iran. That's not true. We have about 3,000 and not more. Some people have even said that there are between 25,000 and 100,000 political prisoners. You deny this? Do I deny it? First of all, it's our business and not of any of their business. But the truth and reality is that we have not more than 3,000. That intelligence agencies like the MI6 or the CIA use violence to achieve some of their goals is no secret. And certainly Savak had also used violence. The CIA's long history of interrogation methods show the US paying lip service to international agreements in the fields of human rights, while at the same time violently torturing whenever circumstances make it seem necessary for them to do so. The Kubark manual reveals only a few hints of scruples in the 128 pages of this horror manual in a rare euphemism of external techniques. 
We are not sure whether a copy of the Kurbak manual was ever actually given to Savak, but we know that the core of the content was given to the Iranian organization. Towards the end of the 1960s, however, Savak used more of the sophisticated methods it had learned from the CIA and the Israeli intelligence service Shabak. The Shah probably saw the shift to sophisticated methods as a further proof of Iran's modernity and these more subtle methods were promoted several times to exonerate the Savak from accusations of cruelty as we see here. Does torture happen in Iran? Well, this is a question that was put to me more than once and which I don't like at all because it's so ridiculous that I don't have to answer that. But for the sake of uh, this interview, I will say that we don't have to torture people. This is the way that uh, unsophisticated uh, organizations were doing things. We are as sophisticated as you are now. Sophisticated in methods of interrogation. Yes. However, it is also very likely that the Shah was never told the details of Savak's method and probably no attempt was ever made to inform him of them as a 1980 television interview by David Frost with the Shah show. When did in this interview, Frost nails the Shah on the word petty details when he said he had more important things to do than listen to individual interrogation reports. The Shah was furious at the allegations of torture and cruelty he was accused of as his relationship with Savak at most was formal as we see here. The Shah never received Parvi Sabeti, the head of Savak's third office, who was responsible for international security and all the allegations against him. The Shah had merely compared the information he received from one organization, let's say Savak, with the information he received from another organization, for example the special office of the inspectorate or the police. Throughout his rule, the Shah's security forces always told him that they had to prioritize and balance the prisoner's right to physical and psychological integrity against the right of the state and the public and that they mainly got their information through psychological means in line with CIA slang coercive methods, which would not constitute torture in the proper sense. You must look at it that way. The Savak was trained by the CIA, so every method the Savak used was used by the CIA as well. The Shah relied on the trainers and advisors of the US and Israel and their clients from Washington, London and Tel Aviv. It is ironic that ultimately it were the very human rights advocates from the United States who claimed to have seen streets full of corpses and prisons full of torture in Iran under the Shah and denounced in Iran what they themselves used to do and sold to Iranians as modern interrogation methods. So basically the Americans demonized the Shah for what they themselves were doing the whole time. Now you might say hold on but I do not remember President Ronald Reagan imprisoning political opponents. Look, Iran was never a perfect democracy, nor did it claim to be one. Second, the Shah was told by his officers that most of the prisoners were terrorists, rather political dissidents, as we can. Iran undoubtedly was not a perfect society, and therefore we should not have accepted its government to be perfect as well. After all, these very people who criticized their king for being authoritarian were the ones who created following the revolution and Islamic dictatorship. That is a totalitarian, if not worse than that of the Shah. In a society where Islam proposes and promotes torture, in a society where corporal punishment of children is part of the education and the teacher's stick is called a flower and respected, one should not wonder that state officials act with all brutality against civilians, without the Shah knowing it, let alone ordering it. Once you realize how primitive and backward the Iranian society back then was, you will no longer wonder why the constitutional revolution was not democratic, 
why the Shah never claimed to be a democrat, why the Iranian opposition was also dictatorial, and why for these anti-Shah protesters the word freedom basically meant our own version of dictatorship. To make it short, a liberal democracy cannot function without an educated middle class, and the Pahlavi dynasty, despite being autocratic, had built the visible and civilized basis to achieve a democracy. But their dictatorial opponents could not use this new atmosphere for their roles, instead they sought Khomeini. The truth is, it does not matter which ideology the Pahlavi kings followed and what thoughts they had or even what rules they followed. Important is what they did, namely the foundation of the modern Iranian state, achieving full sovereignty, economic boom, prosperity and ending the medieval Islamic society which existed during the Qajar era. That's it on my part. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, leave a like. Until next time.